Yeah. 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 Welcome to General Autonomy. Thanks. Great let, to be here. Let me show you around. Please come in. So this is where the team of General Autonomy sits. We are a team of 10 IITNs. Uh, there are people working on simulations, actuators, circuit boards, uh, building teleoperation rigs, collecting data sets and building AI models at the same time. Uh, without taking a lot of your time, let's go straight to the robot. I can help. This is one of our robots that we spent close to 15 months just perfecting the AI model on. This is currently state of the art uh, and I let Bhanu take over the robot and talk more about it. Yeah, so the core of this model is a diffusion transformer. Uh, it takes in four camera feeds. You can see two cameras on the robot, one scene camera above, one scene camera down. Takes in four camera feeds and predicts actions. In order to train it, what we do is we collect data this teleoperator is used to collect data. You, you can see an already trained model here. Uh, the data is collected for three to four hours. As you can see, it, it can also retry if there's a failure. This is a long horizon task. It has to complete all the subtasks in order to complete the entire task. There are plenty of failure points. And as a result, when you first train a model, uh, your model will not be 100% successful. So you need to evaluate it. You'll probably get like 70 to 80% success rate. Then what you need to do is take over, provide certain corrections, build another corrections data set, and do, then do a retraining in order to get to 99% success rate. And as you can see, it's dealing with a very flimsy box. Like we actually designed this for uh, a large EMS player who wanted to do industrial automation in one of the large warehouses. Uh, and yeah, we were able to come, uh, get this VLA to do this very highly dexterous bimanual uh, robotic arm task. Uh, in, in about two months time. But of course, it took us like 15 odd months to perfect the recipe uh, to make this happen. And yeah, that's a box complete. Now, while building all of this, uh, other than these arms that you see, uh, everything else that you see here has been custom built by us from the ground up, including this teleoperation rig. Uh, now here, you can actually essentially wear this teleoperation rig and become the robot yourself. Now all of it, as, you, as, as see, you can see right now. I can control this robot. So if the robot fails at any of the failure point, what I can do is I can just take control, offer some slight corrections, bring it back in distribution, and then let it play. With this technique, you can uh, collect, sorry. <laughs> with this technique, you can collect a corrections data set, which along with your initial data set, gives you 99% success rate. Awesome. Uh, now, uh, telling more about these uh, things that we built here, we've actually 3D printed them. We'll actually take you to our 3D printing bay. Right behind you, on the right hand side, uh, we have spent a lot of our effort in collecting and characterizing variety of 3D printers. This is where we do FDM 3D printing. So as you can see, a part is getting printed right now. Um, the problem with FDM is while it is great, it is cheap. Uh, the errors that originate in FDM printed parts exist not just between layers but also within the layers of the of the printed material. So to avoid that when you're trying to make industrial grade parts for robots, uh, we have actually got a SLA printer where we essentially print everything line by line. Now this is a form labs uh, SLA printer. So essentially we use this resin uh, to you know, basically get it evaporated layer by layer and hence the errors don't exist within layers but they might exist between layers and when we want to go to the final grade we actually get the part CNC uh, and here like as you can see this part was printed and then it got baked uh, as you can see there's a baked part kept here which are essentially uh, knobs for uh, uh, another dog uh, a robot dog of ours that we have been working on and once this baking process is complete, it will be washed here and then uh, somebody would uh, uh, use a scalpel to perfect the parts. Like this one here is a uh, SLA printed part, uh, while this one here is an FDM printed part. Now this is all discarded material, uh, which we keep doing for a lot of our rapid prototyping process. This is a bit toxic, so we should come out of it. This is <laughs> not good for our health. Uh, maybe we'll give you a short tour of our facility in the meanwhile. So. You know, we do a lot of our actuator testing here. Now, this is a 
simple actuator testing rig where we are trying to do system identification for this particular actuator. Uh, this is essentially very important for the hip uh, for the hip joint in a humanoid. This is how actually an actuator looks like. Uh, this is uh, generally used for shoulder joints and hip joints. Uh, this is an uh, outrunner uh, PMSM BLDC motor. And as you can see, like while we are a small startup, we try to stay as organized as possible, but sometimes we just suck at it. Uh, but the reason to stay organized is because we everything we build everything from the ground up. Like this is our circuit board, build it from the ground up, uh, right from other than probably a few components which we actually have to procure from uh, places like Korea, Japan, and some parts yeah, from China, and like and uh, the and Nvidia Jetson. Yeah. Everything else was custom built here uh, from the ground up. Uh, and, and we do that for our circuit boards, for our data collection models, for our teleop rigs, uh, for our PCBs, for uh, stuff like this. Uh, this is again something which only two teams in the world have uh, worked towards and solved for. Uh, and now that is something which in our knowledge it's, it's done by only two teams so far. Uh, this is very essential for uh, building humanoids that can do tasks like washing your dishes or uh, you know putting your clothes in, in the laundry. Uh, now I'll, I'll uh, also maybe we can show you simulation as to how uh, you know humanoids actually learn to walk. So uh, Anu would you want to talk about this? Yeah so this is a simulation that offers us an ability to simulate 5,000, 8,000 robots in parallel that allows the allows us to use PPO algorithm in order to train the robot. We create all kinds of situations in the simulation with which the robot is going to face in the real life and the robot has to figure out an action that allows the robot to follow a certain command like a forward velocity or stand or walk or whatever. Yeah. Now, uh, now the humanoid opportunity while it sounds great, it sounds exciting and it's, it is the future, it's going to happen and it's a fairly big opportunity when you think that every home is going to have a humanoid uh, but the problem is that when every home has a humanoid it has to be affordable uh, and, and for that we believe uh, today uh, the cost of a humanoid essentially lives in the actuator so we have spent a lot of time in building our own actuators while you know like we have these American actuators and Chinese actuators and Japanese actuators with us. This is our first actuator that we built from the ground up. Uh, you know, completely in-house, uh, other than probably the, the magnets that we have to procure uh, from international markets. Uh, the idea is that as the cost of actuator goes down to, you know, a sixth or a tenth, as you can scale the, uh, your investment in building the actuators, you should be able to reduce the cost of a humanoid from something like 50 lakhs today uh, to something like 15 to 12 lakhs. And that becomes in the affordable range. That's, the, that's where the Indian uh, family car lives, you right, in the 12 to 15 lakh range. Uh, today, uh, uh, even before the Indian home or the you know uh, the world home market, there's a there's a salient opportunity that we see right in front of us that the current offering available for developers to work on humanoids is only uh, you know couple of Chinese options and maybe uh, somebody like an open source variant like Kscale, uh, but none of them are. Uh, you know, either very affordable or very useful. Uh, so we think that that is the current market that we can really go after, providing affordable humanoid robots for developers to build applications on top of. Uh, and maybe I'll let uh, you go through our humanoid. This is Atom01, built from the ground up in this office. Uh, parts have been CNC'd here in HSR layout in Bangalore. Uh, it's made of carbon fiber, aluminum, and uh, you know these are act of the shelf actuators. We have not built the actuators in this one, but we built the circuitry. We built our own battery, our own BMS, uh, and our own AI models and data sets uh, to to make it happen. Uh, at the time when it was uh, built, the first time it was the uh, lightest humanoid life size lightest life-size humanoid that could walk in the world uh, but a week later a Chinese company beat us with uh, 2 kgs uh, reduced payload like we were we are at 31 kgs they launched at 29 kgs uh, now I'll stop the talking and maybe show you uh, how it works also uh, it took us four months to completely build yeah. this and uh, apart from the motors everything is built here uh, the machining as you can see the wiring the electronics uh, the communication there's also a process called system identification without which no robot is going to succeed no matter how good your model is. So we have done a lot of good work in system identification and as a result we can say that our robot eventually is going to be at the level of Unity G1. And uh, the simulation you already seen, we train RL policies on top of that. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's get it working.
Ja. Manuel, das liegt jetzt schon. Point three. Now, as you can see, the this is an AI model expressing itself in the physical world and using the motors and and the combination of electronics and mechatronics uh, as a method to express itself. The motors are its paintbrush, and the world is is atoms canvas. Bye. Yeah, we can push it around, we can, you know, give it a slight nudge. We can turn it around if you want. Yeah. Yeah. You can dance with it. Yeah. I see it. I dance with it every day. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, apologies for that small debacle. Uh, see, uh, nothing fatal happened. Essentially, uh, one of the actuators got disconnected and uh, as a fail-safe measure, uh, whenever something like that happens, we get the robot to essentially uh, shut down all motors and fall in its place. Otherwise, it will become violent and you know injure uh, the people around it. Uh, but yeah, we expect that in three months time this uh, we will we'll be able to dance a lot longer with it and uh, ideally we should be uh, opening atom for pre-orders uh, by end of this year and we should ideally be able to ship uh, it to the first uh, 100 people by next year uh, December which is December 2026 uh, and uh, yeah thank you so much for taking our time to come and meet us and hope we get to show you a more cleaner, more robust dancing version of Atom uh, in 12 months time.